Some captive Israel that mourns in lonely exile here until the Son of God. Lord Jesus, there is none other. There is none other worthy of any worship or praise. There is none other worthy of these words that are being sung to you. O oh Lord, accept our praise, our worship, as that which comes from our hearts and pleases you. Amen. I invite you to join together in uh, the confession of sin. I'll, I'll lead the words I'll print it in your bulletin for you to respond. O oh Lord, you are our Father, we are the clay, you are the potter. We are all the work of your hands. Forgive us, Lord, for how we have corrupted your creation. Gracious Lord, you alone are righteous and holy, and in your presence no one can stand. Your gracious mercy is our only hope, and we ask for your forgiveness. We pray for your cleansing touch to wash away our corruption, clothe us in righteousness, and for your hands to rework our lives anew. We pray these things in Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen. If you would look once again to your bulletin, our confession today is a little bit different um, from the first chapter of John. In the Jerusalem Bible translation, I would ask that you would respond with the indented, italicized print as we read through this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things came to be. Not one thing had its being, but through Him. A man came sent by God. His name was John. He came as a witness, as a witness to speak for the light, so that everyone might believe through him. He was not the light, only a witness to see for the light. The Word was the true light that enlightens all men, and he was coming into the world. He came to his own domain, and his own people did not accept him. But to all who did accept him, he gave power to become children of God. To all who believe in the name of him, who did receive him, the Word was made flesh. He lived among us, and we saw his glory. The glory that is His as the only Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. And I ask Elaine Niebuhr to come and bring us the readings. The Epistle for, or the Old Testament reading is from Exodus chapter 12, verses 33 through 36. The Egyptians urged the people to send them out of the land in haste, for they said, We will all be dead. So the people took their dough before it was leavened, with their kneading bowls bound up in the clothes on their shoulders. Now the sons of Israel had done according to the word of Moses, for they had requested from the Egyptians articles of silver and articles of gold and clothing. And the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, so that they let them have their request. Thus they plundered the Egyptians. The epistle for today is found in 1 Peter, chapter 1, verses 10 through 12, on page 1031. 
As to this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful searches and inquiries, seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you. In these things which now have been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit, sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. The gospel is in the book of Luke. I'll be reading from chapter 2, verses 8 through 4, on page 872, and will you please rise. In the same region, there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terribly frightened. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For today in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign for you, and you will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angels a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men, with whom he is pleased. Here ends the Gospel. As I was or have been planning now, we're moving into Advent already today, and I can't believe that. It was just summer yesterday. Um, it struck me that I've only got two weeks to address you on Sunday mornings for Advent. I've got today and next Sunday, because on the 11th, Pastor Ferret will be here. And then on the 18th, we have our children's Christmas program. And then, of course, it's Christmas on the 25th, on a Sunday this year, so uh, I'm sure you're making your plans for that, arrangements for that. But anyway, in light of all of that, I decided to, for this week and next week, stick with one theme, uh, and then present it over these two Sundays. And I, I think, or at least I'm hoping and praying that you'll see a strong connection between this Advent theme, that which we're going to open today, and then culminating next Sunday in our communion service, um, because there really is a strong connection. So uh, that's kind of the plan for these two weeks, and then we'll move into some other things. But uh, the theme that we're going to look at is, it's a prophetic theme, and it's, it's the prophetic sign as it was given to some shepherds on the night that Jesus was born. Now you just heard a portion of the Christmas story as Elaine read from Luke 2 a few moments ago. Uh, in particular, you heard that portion of that story that pertains to the shepherds. You might have picked up on that. And some of you might be wondering, you know, what connection is there between these shepherds in Luke 2 and prophecy? if this is a prophetic sign to the shepherds. I mean, that might sound a little bit far-fetched on the surface. So I want to look at that this morning. Um, the scripture takes us out into the middle of a field. Sometime during this particular night that Jesus came into the earth in, in human flesh, and the, and the scripture says, and suddenly there are, the angels from heaven appeared to some shepherds. And here's what's so significant. The angels made to those shepherds the most important announcement that has ever been made to anyone in the history of this world. Unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who's Christ the Lord. Now, what does that announcement have to do with the prophets? 
or the whole idea of prophecy. You know, just about everything the prophets were about in reality culminates in the coming of Jesus, whether we're talking about his first coming or his second coming. So the event that the angels announced um, wasn't a foreign concept to what the prophets prophesied. I mean, I, wanna, I want you to hear this again. Now, as we're, as we're really keeping this context before us, you heard 1 Peter chapter 1, concerning this salvation that the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, in, inquiring what person or what time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating. See, the Spirit of God came upon these prophets hundreds of years before this night when the shepherds were spoken to by the angels. And those prophets wondered, I wonder what God is really doing. When does this come to pass? Who is this that I know I'm supposed to proclaim, but I don't understand? So it says they talked about these things. They wondered what God was doing, even as they were vessels of what God was doing, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he pre predicted the sufferings of Christ. Now, when they heard Christ... They didn't automatically think, oh, Jesus of Nazareth. They had no idea who the Christ was. Um, and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you. Peter's writing to a first century audience here. And he says, it came to their attention, to these prophets' attention, that what God was speaking wasn't pertaining to their lifetimes, much of it, but to yours, first century people in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which even angels long to look. Um, the message of the Messiah's coming wasn't an unfamiliar one. And by the way, when we use the term Messiah or Christ, same word. Christ is Greek, Messiah is Hebrew, same exact word. Um, it was the one, that, so, so the, the idea, the message of his coming wasn't an unfamiliar message. It was the ones to whom this announcement was made that seems pretty foreign and maybe far-fetched. The, the Sunday school adult class was way ahead of me this morning because they asked this very question, why the shepherds? And that's my question to you. Why was this announcement made to shepherds? I mean, if God was fulfilling the most important event that had ever taken place in the history of the earth up to that point, why entrust the announcement of that event to a few people who not only were not connected in any way to the movers and shakers of the Hebrew culture and society, they weren't even considered to be credible witnesses. They couldn't testify in court. Did you know that? A shepherd was not allowed to testify because they were considered everything that comes out of their mouth is a lie. That's how much respect they had in the eyes of the public. Shepherds were at the bottom of the social strata. I mean, you, you, you think, you've probably studied of the caste system in India. The shepherds were the, at the bottom of that. They didn't have a great reputation, and, and for a lot of reasons, uh, some of them very justifiable and others not. We won't go into those today. And, and certainly there were shepherds who were men and, and women. We, we were in Jordan and Israel two years ago. There were a lot of women shepherds. I suspect there were back in the day too. Uh, but certainly there were shepherds who were of noble character and people who had integrity. And yet, unfortunately, they got washed into the same stereotype as shepherds in general. So that was... That was <laughs> the people to whom God decided to bring this message. A group of shepherds just outside of Bethlehem, uh, very, possibly, very possibly shepherds who were raising sheep for the Passover sacrifice in Jerusalem just six miles away. So this morning, we're not so much going to be looking at any particular spoken prophecy out of the mouths of people who might come to mind when you think of what is a prophet or what is prophecy. Rather, we're going to be looking at how, how God sometimes gives a prophetic message and how he prophetically reveals his word and his truth 
and his purpose, sometimes just in the living out of the lives of, of people, sometimes his own people, sometimes not. Sometimes people who don't even acknowledge him. And sometimes God gives a prophetic message and picture through the events that transpire in history. For example, you know that Hosea is one of the minor prophets. Do you know what Hosea's life must have been like? He was a prophet because of the way he, God asked him to live his life. God said, I want you to marry this woman, Gomer, who he did marry, and she went out and had one affair after another. She went out to live with this guy, and that guy would kick her out. She went to live with another guy. And God said to Hosea, you're not going to divorce her. You're going to love her unconditionally. His life was a prophetic message of the unconditional love of God. Guess who Gomer represents? Us. Israel, or us. Guess who Hosea represents? It's a picture of Christ, who loves us unconditionally in spite of our sinfulness and wandering. There are some names in Scripture which might not right away come to our minds when we think of prophets, but who were very much looked upon as prophets by the Jewish people, and more importantly, who were chosen by God as people who were to speak forth His Word, which, by the way, is a definition of prophet. Sometimes we think of prophets as a fortune teller. That's not a correct definition. A prophet is merely one who speaks forth the Word of God. And the Bible says God can speak into any context He chooses, because God isn't one who looks to the future like we do and says, I wonder what's going to happen. He sees the future, the Bible says, as clearly as he sees the past. So if God speaks into today what he's doing in our midst, that's prophecy if it's a word from the Lord. If God speaks into what's going to happen in 50 years from now because he sees it as clearly as you sitting here, that's prophecy. Sometimes it's speaking into the future, sometimes it's not. I want to take you way back in Israel's history to the time when Israel was birthed as a nation, and I'm going to use this metaphor of being birthed because God uses that metaphor in the Scripture. And as any birthing happens in this life, it happens through labor and usually a lot of pain and a lot of increasing pressure. We know what that means when we're talking about a person being physically born, being born into this world, don't we? But what does that look like, this birthing? What does that look like when we're talking about a nation being birthed? It looks like the Hebrew people coming out of a long period of labor and pain and increasing pressure in the land of Egypt until the day they were delivered through the waters of the Red Sea and became a nation. Now, I want you to see how that event is connected prophetically to the word that was spoken by an angel 1,500 years later to some shepherds who were out keeping watch over their flock by night, just outside of Bethlehem. The angel said to the shepherds, Fear not, for I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And then these words from the angel. And this will be a sign to you. This will be a sign to you. I'm going to pause here and say something. When God sends an angel to earth with a message, and in that message God says, I'm going to give you a sign. He's not talking about a road marker as evidence that you're on the right path. He's not saying, if you find this clue, then you'll know you found the right baby. No, when God gives a sign, He's giving evidence that He is doing something that is not humanly possible something which is not able to be understood 
unless God gives revelation. And in fact, the Greek word, as we talked about in Sunday school this morning, do you know what the Greek word for sign is? Same exact word as the word miracle. Sign, semea. That's the Greek word for miracle. So when the angel said to the shepherd, this will be a sign for you, he's saying, what I'm going to tell you next is going to be the evidence that points to something miraculous, something only God can do, and something that will only be understood as God gives understanding. What's the sign? Listen again. Here's the sign. This will be a sign to you. You'll find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths lying in a manger. Confused yet? I'll give you this much to go on. The sign, the miracle, is inseparably tied to the identity of the one who was born. The angel had already identified him. Unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord, who is Messiah. They would have used the word Messiah because they spoke Hebrew. They didn't speak Greek. The one, by the way, for whom Israel was eagerly waiting. Now, there's a caution here which Israel didn't heed. And it's this. And I think it speaks across the board to humanity. Sometimes we get an idea in our heads of what is supposed to happen or maybe what something means to God when our understanding is really our own interpretation of it. Was Israel's understanding of Messiah, Christ, the same as God's? No. When Israel was anticipating the coming of their Messiah, they had no idea. They didn't, it didn't enter their mind that this coming Messiah was going to be God. Did you know that? We kind of think Christ, oh, that means God. No, it doesn't. It means Savior. It means one coming from the lineage of David. It means one that had been promised from days of old. doesn't, in their mind, mean God. So when the angel said... This will be a sign. You'll find this baby who is Messiah. There was an implication in the words of the angels that Israel didn't understand. And most of Israel does not understand to this day. Do you remember when Peter preached on Pentecost? I'm getting off track here, but I, I, just to help make this point. In the book of Acts, he's preaching, and he, and he, as the Holy Spirit came, he announces the whole crowd of thousands who had gathered for the festival, one of the major festivals, and he said, I want you to know something, men of Israel. This Jesus, whom you crucified, is both Christ, is your Messiah, as you anticipated one was coming, and Lord, and Yahweh. And when they heard that, the Bible says they were cut to the quick. They couldn't believe, because the Holy Spirit was giving them understanding. They couldn't believe that they had either done it by their words and by their political influence, or whether they had stood by and, and let it happen. They couldn't believe they had put to death their God. And they said, what are we supposed to do? And Peter said, repent. <laughs> repent. So the message of the angel to the shepherds was, yes, the one born tonight is the one you've been waiting for. He is your Messiah, but he's more than that. He's Lord. He is God in human flesh. Colossians 2.9, Paul says, in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. The sign, getting back to the sign, here it is. You're going to find him wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. We need to look at that sign but first we need to go back to Egypt 1,500 years prior to that night outside of Bethlehem. Egypt was the superpower of the world up until this deliverance event took place. Do you know that? You could make the case that Egypt nearly died in childbirth as the surrogate mother of Israel. 
When Israel took Egypt's wealth, and you, we heard that read from, as Elaine read from Exodus, when, he, when they took Egypt's wealth with them, all of her gold and silver and a lot of clothing, when Egypt's military might was destroyed completely as Israel was coming through the birth canal of the Red Sea, I'm continuing in the metaphor God uses about birthing a nation, Egypt, in the aftermath of that, was in critical condition. Up until that time, and for many centuries preceding it, Egypt was the world's superpower, the only nation producing wheat in enough quantities to feed the world. They were the breadbasket of the world. And this was the nation God chose to be the birthing ground of Israel a place that provided bread. What started out well, you remember Joseph and how he was in charge of the grain, and in his wisdom, Egypt and, and the nation surrounding her survived a very severe uh, seven-year famine. But after Joseph had died and after the Pharaoh who knew Joseph had died, things got bad for the Hebrew people in a, hur in a hurry. And they went through a long time of hard labor. And as labor does, it got worse and worse as their delivery grew nearer and nearer. Moses was the man God chose to be the deliverer, the doctor. Let's look at the night of Israel's deliverance. Back to Exodus 12 again, verse 33, as you heard. The Egyptians were urgent with the people to send them out of the land in haste, for they said, we're all going to be dead. So the people took their dough before it was leavened, their kneading bowls being bound up in their cloaks on their shoulders. So we're reading about what happened after ten plagues had fallen on Egypt. Pharaoh had finally been broken. He told Moses to take the people, take your livestock, get out of Egypt. You understand we're looking at the Passover here, right? When the angel of death passed over every household that, would, that was marked by the blood of the sacrificed lamb on its doorpost. What I want you to see in this short passage of Exodus 12 is what God had instructed, instructed them to do with the bread. First of all, God said, don't leaven it. Don't leaven the dough. You don't have time. What does Scripture tell us in the New Testament about leaven? It represents sin. There's an interesting drama played out in Matthew 16 when the Pharisees and the Sadducees came out into the countryside of Galilee to, to find Jesus for the purpose of asking him for a sign from heaven. Prove yourself. And Jesus made a comment that they wouldn't be given any sign because they were leaders of an evil and adulterous generation. Remember, a sign is something that only can be seen and understood as God gives understanding. Well, he gives understanding to those who seek him, doesn't he? Something the Pharisees and Sadducees were not doing. So Jesus said to his disciples in that scenario, he said, watch and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Represents sin. Back to Egypt, 1500 B.C. The Israelites were instructed to prepare the dough for their bread without leaven. And look what they did with it. They wrapped it in, clo in their cloaks. They wrapped it in cloths and carried it on their shoulders out of Egypt. Now, you need to know there, there's more going on here, Redeemer, than simply carrying out an, uh, this, this Exodus event in an expedient manner. Back to Bethlehem, 1,500 years later. Keep that picture of what they did with the leaven, unleavened bread. This will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. A sign. Something miraculous, something only God can do, something not able to be understood unless God gives understanding. And we're going to pick it up here next Sunday. 
And as we explore a little deeper into what God was saying when he instructed the Hebrew people to wrap the unleavened bread in their cloaks. Let's pray. Father, you are God who speaks truths in ways that can only be understood as your spirit gives us understanding. Oh God, we believe your word. Even the parts of it we don't understand and we would ask you that you would increase our understanding and may the, the inclination and the direction of our hearts be toward you always. In Jesus' name, amen.